about four years ago, um, I had a meeting with a venture capitalist. Uh, it wasn't a very happy meeting. I was actually going to shut down my company, a company that I had founded and that I ran for about four years. And uh, I was actually closing it down. The point of the meeting was I wanted to apologize to them and I wanted to let them know, you know, I'm sorry I lost all your money. And, uh, uh, you know, we decided to meet for coffee one morning. Uh, so, so Chris was actually very nonchalant about it. He said that, you know, hey, if these things happen. Nine out of ten companies uh, that we fund actually go down. Uh, we've already factored in the risk. Uh, so, you know what? It doesn't matter. And he started asking me, what are you going to do next? So at that point, uh, I was actually a little burned out. Uh, because as you know, four years of uh, running your own startup, not an easy thing. And so I said, you know, Chris, I'm not really sure what I want to do, but the one thing is I don't want to go back and be an engineer. I want to do something else. And then so he asked me, so what, tell me more about what are your aspirations in the future? Will you do another startup? And I said, yes, 100%, I'm going to do another startup. Uh, so it's, you know, sometime in my future, I probably got one or two more uh, left in me. And, uh, but for the time being, I want to go to a big company, but I really don't know what to do at that big company. So uh, that's when he said, you know, have you ever looked into product management? So I said, I said, no, I, had, I don't know what that is. And then, so he said, hey, you know what? It's actually like CEO in training. And uh, you know, if you go and do it at a big company, you'll gain a lot of experience, and uh, you know, it's something that's uh, a very interesting role, right? And so that night, I remember googling uh, product management. I, I looked at some job descriptions, and I was like, "Wow, this is what I really want to do," right? So, um, and then a few years later, here I am. Uh, my name is Manu Prasanna. I'm a product manager at VMware. I'm a product manager at the Cloud Management Suites business unit uh, at VMware. And we make uh, products that help you manage your uh, public clouds as well as your private clouds. Uh, that is, we uh, help you uh, with your cloud management platforms, uh, especially if you're a big enterprise. So my talk is going to be about how you can be the best PM you can be. Uh, I've kind of, you know, looked back at my career as a PM, looked at all of my experiences, and I've put together uh, some some thoughts for you and some themes uh, where I think that if you follow those, uh, you can be a much better PM. So the first theme is uh, be the most interesting person in the room, right? Product management is not really well defined. And it really means different things in different companies. Uh, but one thing is for sure that you know you have to be very interesting. It's uh, it, it's something where, like I said, it means different things in different companies. And so let's look at uh, what it really means, right? So one of the things is that you are the CEO of your own product. So, you know, you're in complete control of what happens to that product, or you should be in complete control, right? So, regardless of what you want to do with that product, whether it's bringing a new product to market, whether it's entering a new market, whether it's maintaining a product that already exists and making it better, adding features, or it could be that you're sunsetting a product and you literally have to support some customers uh, during that period, right? So. It really depends on where in the life cycle you are, uh, but really you are the CEO of your own product. And also, uh, if you really think about it, uh, every company has a value creation piece. So I know some of you are engineers and some of you are uh, researchers. So that is really the value creation piece of a company, right? So there are the value creators and then there are the value capture folks, right? So those are the folks that actually take the value that you created and then they go and capture the value. And who are those? 
those are the sales folks, those are the marketing folks, and usually executives also fall under the value capture bucket, right? And the next thing I want to say is product management is really an intersection of a lot of different things. So it's the intersection of technology and engineering. Uh, so you have to work very closely with engineering. Uh, you have to be able to talk technical. Um, and then it's also an intersection of design. So you know you, you want to be, be able to uh, you know design uh, a really beautiful product, right? And so uh, you've got to have some sort of design intuition. Uh, be able to work with some of the folks uh, you know that are uh, in the UI UX uh, organization within your company, and uh, so so there's definitely that design aspect, right? And if it's a if it's a consumer company, uh, sometimes there's a little bit of psychology also involved, right? You got to really get into the heads of your customers, and you got to help uh, you know you got to understand like what they really want. So you can build the right product for them. Um, and then finally, there's the business piece. So business, like I said before, uh, these you have to interact with the value capture folks, the sales and marketing folks. Um, so you know you have to be able to talk business to them. So you have to be able to talk technical to the engineers. You have to be able to talk business to uh, you know the sales and marketing folks, right? And the other thing I want to mention. Is that you know there are things that don't fall under any bucket sometimes. So what happens is as you're building a product, there's certain things where it's like you don't have a person to do it, right? And you're like, you know, who's gonna do this? But at the end of the day, if you're a product manager, you have to be proactive. You have to roll up your sleeves and do it, right? So if there's something a task where you don't really know who have, who can do it in your company. You know, if you're a good product manager, you will do it. And then um, the last thing I want to point out is, you know, a product being a product manager involves interacting with different um, divisions or different business units uh, within your company, right? And there's a lot of conflicts. There's you know personalities. There's politics. So you you have to navigate all of this. And very often, what happens is uh, you end up uh, being a shrink, right? You have to literally uh, talk to folks and, and sort out uh, some of their differences. Uh, in my career, I've seen that you know there's there's always some you know tension between, say, the engineers and, and uh, let's say the support organization. So in one of the companies that I used to work in, uh, the engineers and the support organization didn't get along. So every time I went to support and I said you know hey uh, we're getting a lot of escalations what's going on so they're like oh engineering you know these guys suck they don't give us the right guidance and you know as a result we don't know how to handle these cases and then I go to engineering and they're like oh we already told them all this but you know they don't they don't do it on the support calls and as, as a result we have all these escalations, but we're also building the product. We don't have the bandwidth to do this, right? So it's very commonplace. So sales, engineering, you know, sometimes they they don't they don't communicate with each other very well. Uh, but then, as a product manager, you are that conduit. You are that bridge between these uh, different organizations, between these business units. And sometimes you really have to sort things out. Uh, you know, you have to be a shrink to them. Um, the other thing I will mention is what you do as a PM really depends on the life cycle of the product, right? So it really depends on where the life cycle of the product is. And so when you land a product management role, I highly recommend that you know exactly what part of the life cycle it is in. Because, you know, doing a PM for a new product, especially one where the company is entering a new market, is very, very, very different than doing like regular maintenance or you know sunsetting a product. So I will say that I've had the opportunity to have uh, worked at a small company as 
well as a, a few big companies. And I've done both engineering and product management at small and big companies. And uh, worked on different parts of the life cycle. Uh, but one thing I will highly recommend you folks is that, you know, find out exactly where in the life cycle a product is. I remember um, I joined a company where, you know, I was offered a role as a PM for one particular product. And it was a little bit of a switch and bait. So on the first day, they, they said, hey, Manu, we think you're a better fit for this other product. And then, so I was like, you know, a little bit of a deer in the headlights kind of situation. I said, okay, well, this looks good. Um, you know, I'm ready for it, right? I was like, well, I'm just gonna roll up my sleeves and do it. And then when I started meeting more folks at that company, you know, people were like smiling and they're like, oh, you're the new PM for this product. Like, good luck to you, you know? And so I was wondering, you know, hey, like, is there something I, I don't really know? And sh sure enough, after, you know, about a month, I discovered that I'm seen as the turnaround guy. And I didn't even know it. I was supposed to turn around that product. It was actually a product that was failing. So, um, you know, I think that the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, like, you, you've got to roll up your sleeves and do the job, but at the same time, do as much diligence as you can ahead of time, right? And, and sometimes it's not in your control. Like, for instance, um, I'll tell you at VMware, I work as a product manager, like I said, on the cloud management platform. So what happened was, it was a very well-defined product. Uh, we had a very well-defined market. But when I joined, uh, what I discovered is that, you know, that market is actually shifting, right? So there were three main or major uh, tectonic shifts that were happening in that market. So one of the shifts was, uh, so let me just give you some background, right? So as uh, VMware uh, has some of the world's largest enterprises as uh, their customers. And so every, every enterprise today is also a software company. Every company is a software company. And to run software, you can run it on a private data center or you can run it on a public cloud. So you can run it on an Amazon or uh, you know, Microsoft Azure or you know, a Google uh, Cloud Platform, right? So what we, what we noticed is that there was this shift happening that every single enterprise was slowly moving from private cloud to public cloud. That is, they had like an on-premises data center, but slowly they were increasing their public cloud footprint. So that was one tectonic shift that was happening in the market. The other shift that was happening is that it used to be that IT made all the decisions in our customer base. So they called all the shots, they chose the cloud providers, they chose the tools that the developers use. But what we saw happening was in the new way of doing things, developers were becoming more and more powerful, right? So developers were choosing the cloud providers that they wanted to use. Developers were choosing the tools that they wanted to use. And IT was, was following suit, right? So, I mean, if you go look, uh, you know, I was at uh, Amazon's conference recently, Amazon reInvent, it's called. So at reInvent, uh, what you see is, you see uh, you know, execs from Amazon, they go up on stage like an Andy Jassy and talks about, you know, everything that's new with AWS. And so they talk about a lot of different new services. And what you see is there's a lot of developers, you know, wearing hoodies and they're kind of high fiving each other every time there's a new product announcement. And, and, you know, that is sort of the new world for us, right? Because developers are, you know, leading the front, leading the charge, right? So, and, and especially in companies like, say, like a, you know, like a Netflix or an Uber, uh, a lot of these companies that uh, do what's called rapid application deployment, uh, especially the developers are, are much more prominent. So the shift to public cloud was one. The shift to developer was another shift that we saw. And the third shift that we saw was every single enterprise wanted to go faster, right? 
So as I mentioned before, uh, you know, you've got the Ubers of, of the world, the uh, Netflixes of the world. I mean, if you if you look on your phone or if you look on your TV, you probably use some of those applications, Uber, Netflix, or Facebook. And and so if you really look, uh, those applications they change in the back end. You may or may not know this, but when you open up that app in the morning and when you open it up in the evening, the back end is just not the same. And it's not just changed once or twice, it's actually changed hundreds of times in that day, right? So that's what I call rapid application deployment. I mean, to you, you may not even notice it, but that is really what is happening. And it's not like all enterprises want to go at breakneck speed, uh, but what we see is that slowly but surely, um, we notice that there, every single company has a software development maturity model, and you know there are sort of these finance companies, insurance companies who release software in a very waterfall-like way, so they release every you know six months or every year, and then you've got the Netflixes and Ubers that are releasing hundreds and hundreds of times a day. Uh, but there's one pattern that you notice, that every single enterprise wants to go from left to right. That is, they want to go from less mature to more mature, right? So the three shifts, so move to public cloud, uh, shift to developers, and rapid application deployment, or you know, faster time to market. So what I had to do was I had to go interview more than 100 enterprise customers, and then I had to figure out, you know, how do we build a new product or a new platform, or I, in that case, it was, a, a, you know, like a Gen 2 platform to address these two, three new market shifts, right? So in, in this case, it's not like I showed up at work and then they made me work on a different product, but the market has shifted. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you've got to be, you know, highly reactive, highly responsive, and I will say, I will say you want to be more proactive as a product manager. Uh, get in front of all these type of changes that happen, and you've got to be very well informed. Right? Do your due diligence, figure out what's happening, and figure out how that job is going to evolve. Okay, so I spoke to some of you earlier, um, and it seems like many of you are breaking into, are trying to break into product management, right? And you come from different areas. Uh, some of you are students, some of you are engineers, and uh, I think there are you know, people with other backgrounds as well. Um, so what I want to tell you is that successful PMs come from different backgrounds, right? And you have to use your strengths as a PM. I've seen a lot of, like, I work with PMs who are extremely successful, and, you know, one of the PMs that is on my team, she has, like, a, um, a degree in literature, right? And she's one of the best PMs I've met. So what I'm trying to tell you is don't worry about, you know, your background, and I know it's Silicon Valley, and everyone thinks that, hey, if I'm not coming, I don't, I don't come from a technical background, it's hard for me to you know, do any product management. It's not true at all. Right? I've seen PMs come from sales who are very good. Um, I've seen a, there's a PM from, who comes from customer success in my organization. And she knows every single customer. You know, she knows their family. She knows their wives, their husbands, their kids. Uh, she is extremely good at human relationships. right? And so she uses that as a strength and you know when you have a team of PMs especially it helps to have PMs who are strong in different areas some are better more internally focused some are externally focused some are more technical some are more customer friendly so you know it really helps to have like a diverse team of PMs and so what I, what I want you to take away is that you know it's don't think that just because you don't come from a traditional background that you can't break into product management. Um, I've got a few, uh, you know, I've seen a few PMs. Uh, there was one PM um, who I remember, 
uh, came from a Wall Street background, right? And we were working, uh, I was working at a security company at the time. So the guy literally, you know, he didn't have much of a technical background, uh, but he was a very smart guy, I, I will say. And so I really saw this guy, you know, he was like, like he, he was faking it until he made it, right? So what he would do is he would go, like as soon as he joined the company, he set up a meeting with the, you know, the VP of engineering. And they asked him, hey, you know, what, what is it that keeps you up at night? And uh, what's your biggest problem, right? So he didn't know any of the answers, but he just got those questions. And then he went, he went, I think, to the VP of sales and to like the C-level officer. And then he asked the same question, but the VP of engineering had asked him, hey, how do you think you can solve this problem? And that was the VP of engineering's biggest problem, right? And then he asked, uh, you know, what keeps you up at night? And he kind of, he went to every single executive and did that. And he started com coming up with some of his own answers and like intertwining what they had said to him. And pretty soon they thought that he was coming up with some of this stuff, right? <laughs> and, you know, this guy did it very successfully. He was, he was a smart guy. And I think that, um, you know, he definitely, um, you know, he, he was... He was playing big. He was, uh, you know, he did was not shy of going and talking to to any person in the company. So he used that as a strength. Um, you also want to bring your unique perspective. So, like I said, you know, there's a there's a lady that I work with, customer, uh, you know, sort of the customer success is kind of her strength. Human relationships. She's really good at that. So I don't know what it means for you, right? But you should know what it means for you and bring that strength to the table and you will be a good product manager. And also be aware of your own biases, right? So, you know, one of the things that I told you about is that, uh, you know, I worked on a product where the end customer was developers, right? And I was a developer for 10 years. But at the same time, that can work against you sometimes. Because you have this bias about, hey, this is how I think developers work. But at the same time, it may not be the case. You have to talk to different customers and see how things have evolved. And I was a developer uh, you know, a few years ago. And if you look at the whole DevOps ecosystem, it's very advanced. It's matured a lot. So, you know, if I had used my own bias and if I had like a, an agenda and not speak to a customer with an open mind, I might end up building a product that's, you know, that's not one that they necessarily want, right? So there's always a danger of that. So know that, you know, when you come from a certain arena, you bring certain strengths to the table, but there's also some bias that you bring. So be aware of what they are. And if you've got an engineering background, I know some of you have an engineering background, you know, that's fantastic. Um, you know, you can be very technical. Uh, what I've seen, uh, and of course I'm not saying all engineers are like this, this is just in my experience in Silicon Valley. I think the PMs who come from an engineering background, uh, they need to kind of work a little more on their people skills, right? Like they need to, um, you know, talk to customers more, get out more. So for any PM that's that comes from engineering, my advice to them is, don't don't spend much time at your desk. You should be talking to people. Like go, you know, spend time on the floor. Go talk to different folks. Go go on customer trips. Go talk to as many customers as you can. So get that, you know, customer perspective. Get that outside perspective. Uh, you already have a technical background. That's a huge advantage. Uh, but make sure you you polish up on on the other aspects of what it means to be a, a PM. Um, and like I said, diversity of ideas is good. Um, if you know, uh, some of the best teams that I worked on are teams that come from different backgrounds, different um, you know, the different disciplines. Um, you know, and, and I will say that um, you know, as as someone who's um, been on a few patents, uh, you know, the inventions happen when. 
people from from different uh, arenas kind of work together, and it you know you push the boundary of innovation when you work with people who are experts at different things, right? So diversity of ideas is very good. So uh, know what your strengths are, bring those to the table. Uh, that's my advice to you. Um, PM and engineering. Now this is a very special relationship, right? You gotta be tied at the hip with your uh, engineering leads. Uh, because at the end of the day, these are the people uh, that are gonna build your product, right? And you really want to earn the respect of engineering. Uh, so obviously be very well prepared when you go talk to engineering folks. Uh, especially in Silicon Valley, it's, you know, we've got some of the best engineers in the world. Um, so, you know, it doesn't matter if you're not technical, um, you know, at least go and learn about it. You know, maybe what you can do is, um, is make a buddy in engineering, uh, go out for lunch with the engineering folks. Um, you know, I do that all the time. Good conversations happen over, uh, during uh, lunch. Um, and then, you know, maybe you can uh, maybe you can uh, develop a friend in engineering who um, who can ask embarrassing questions. You know, like the first day of uh, being a PM uh, of a certain product, I didn't understand it very well. So I asked someone in engineering, "Hey, what does this product actually do?" And so, uh, what I'm trying to tell you is, don't don't be afraid to kind of ask. You know the, the dumb questions or the seemingly silly questions and you know have like a maybe like a buddy in engineering who you can talk to and ask you know, these types of questions um, you know pay attention to different types of personalities um, this is especially true um, you know where you want to get something done uh, I remember at uh, VMware I was working with a team uh, based in Eastern Europe, right? And one of the engineering leads, uh, he was extremely hard um, to kind of convince to do like what we wanted him to do, right? So um, I actually, we'll, we'll just call him Ivan. Um, so I flew to Eastern Europe to meet Ivan. And uh, I remember it was Wednesday and uh, you know, I said, "Hey, let's 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 meet, and I want to have a, like I have an agenda. I want to talk to you about something." And so he kind of avoided me Wednesday and Thursday, and on Friday evening he set up a meeting, and then uh, I just said hi, and then he talked for a whole hour, and then it was a one hour meeting. So he basically, uh, it was very hard to get through to this person. Is what I'm trying to say. So uh, what I what I then realized is that he has a number two guy and the number two guy he really listened to right so what I did was I, I became more friendly with the number two guy and then so before any meeting I would have a meeting with that person uh, prep him for the meeting and then so when the meeting with Ivan actually happened um, you know when I asked Ivan to do something he would be very skeptical but he would look at the, the other guy <laughs> The other guy would say, yeah, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> and then Ivan was like, okay, we're, we're going to do it, right? <laughs> so, you know, developer strategy, know how these people work, right? And so, um, it, you know, you got to brush up on your technical aspects. It was, like I said, in Silicon Valley, you will not be respected unless you're a little technical. So uh, brush up on those aspects. And uh, you know, engineers actually like it when they come up with ideas. So use your engineers as an asset, right? So they love it when they come up with an idea and you implement it. So what I do is sometimes I actually involve the engineers in the conversations that I have with customers so they can hear straight from the customers. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's their idea and they're like, yeah, this is exactly what we need to do. And they're a lot more motivated. And sometimes you can even see the idea, right? It could be your idea, but if you kind of see it, and then they're like, hey, how about we do this? And you're like, yes, you know, that's what we want to do. And the moment they think that it's their idea, 
they are much more motivated to do it, right? <coughs> so these are all like strategies uh, that you will um, learn over time. Uh, but the one thing I will tell you is that don't let engineering walk all over you. They will do it. Uh, and if you let them do it, you're going to end up with a product that you're capable of building. You're not going to end up with what, you're not necessarily going to end up with what the customer wants, right? So be very careful. Uh, you know, you've got to lead people, right? So you've got to lead engineering. If they lead you, then you're just going to build a product which the customers may not want, like I said. So, um, you know, you all hear that as a PM, you've got to be a great storyteller. That's true. Uh, but what I will say is that you also have to be a great listener, right? So, you know, don't have an agenda. Like, don't, uh, you know, people say that uh, Steve Jobs knew what the customers wanted. He said they're all, you know, I know what they want and I'm going to build it for them. It's not true, right? You know, people at Apple who really knew him know that, you know, he kind of went to the Apple store on the weekends. He spent three hours just watching what customers did, right? So, obviously, he did a lot of research and, you know, he gathered a lot of knowledge about what customers want, right? And that's what you have to do. Don't, don't have an agenda. You might think you know what the customers want, but you really got to listen, right? without any bias, without any filter, um, and, and you know, you got to spend more time with them, uh, talk to as many customers as you can. Um, so, you know, for an enterprise product, I would say that, you know, you talk to um, as many customers as you can, make road trips, uh, you know, go meet the customer, right? Actually spend time with them, meet them at their office, you know, maybe you spend a whole day with them, starting from, you know, when they make coffee in the morning, right? Like, you have to literally get into their heads and understand how they think and how they work in order for you to build that product. And this is true of um, enterprise also. I mean, you, you can say, uh, I mean, people say, you know, B to C, to consumer, business to consumer, B to B, right? But at the end of the day, it's all human to human, right? Even in the enterprise, uh, you have, for enterprise products, you might have multiple personas, uh, but you, you are serving that persona in the customer organization. Go and spend time with those folks, because I think that the more time uh, you spend with them, the more you know about how they work, uh, and the better product you'll be able to build. And I think for consumer products, it's even more important. For consumer products, I would say you have to really get out there, you need to ask as many consumers as possible, 